Hi everybody, how are we doing? Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, my name's Emma and you are here with me on Let There Be Music. Um, I am a musician. I am from Galway in the West of Ireland and I have recently signed up with um, an organisation called Music Declares Emergency. And what music is declaring an emergency about is uh, the climate crisis and what's happening with the climate crisis. So as an artist who signed up to this, I have committed myself to talking about climate science um, and kind of promoting the cause of our planet and our environment whenever I can to talk to other musicians about how we can make those kinds of things better and how we can develop practices within our industry to do a better job for the climate. So this is video number three of a series of three that I wanted to do as part of my you know, trying to play my part in making sure that all of us are as much as we can sharing information, accurate information about what is happening um, to our environment, to us, to other people in the world, to our species, to other species in an effort to try and mitigate what has already started to happen in terms of entering into a mass extinction and um, seeing a lot of the things we know begin to start to slip away. So if this sounds extreme to you, I mean, I empathise with that. If you're very new to the cause of climate change and it's a very recent thing to you to see protesters out and people working on that kind of thing, then this will sound extreme and it will come as a bit of a surprise and a bit of a shock. But if you're someone who's been engaged with environmental causes like you know simple things like clean air uh, reducing pollution recycling you'll know that uh, scientists around the world have been issuing emergency warnings for many 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 years now um warning us that our planet is is moving a bit too far so today i wanted to talk about something that doesn't actually get a lot of coverage at all which is the science the science behind what it is we're all talking about. Um, we see a lot of calls uh, by people like Greta Thunberg saying, I want you to follow the science. I don't want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to the scientists. But it can actually be really hard to find the science. So most of the articles that I've been able to find or when I read about um, climate change, they have their key figures. They have... Um, the 1.5 degree Celsius temperature rise that we're trying not to hit globally. Um, some organisations will report a 2 uh, degree Celsius uh, global temperature rise that we should be trying to avoid. But what a lot of them don't talk about is how that's breaking down. Now, I understand when we're, when we're sending out mass messages, we want to try and have something we can rally around, a number we can rally around, a goal we can set ourselves but this doesn't really help to convey the urgency of what it is is happening to our world, to the world that we live in, and to our brothers and sisters all over the world who live in the majority world or indigenous peoples. Um, so today I wanted to do a bit of a chat about the science behind what we're talking about. So I said about today when I sat down to do a little bit of research for this again, I said, look, I'm going to Google see what the latest reports are, see what I can find about this and that and the other. And what I've discovered so far is a little bit disheartening. Media are not reporting any of the key figures that we need to know at all. Um, so I thought I would like to share some figures with you from a source that I've been reading lately. Talk to you a little bit about what Ireland are doing and where the UK is at, because those are the two areas that I know a bit about. Um, not everything, but a little bit. And maybe help you think about how you can get the conversation going. Or if you're not sure, I mean, some of us are seasoned at questioning media, so you're not going to need my help with this. But some of us are probably new to this concept. So I wanted to read a few things out to you. So um, welcome to this climate reading. I am your host, Emma O'Reilly. Um, I'm going to talk you through some of the stuff that I have been uh well, some of the things that have come up in more recent months, I want to try and keep it recent. And um, some of the facts that are actually in play with uh, the crisis that we're facing right now. So I want to read for you a little bit first. Um, 
this comes from chapter one of a book called This Is Not A Drill. This Is Not A Drill is published by the Extinction Rebellion and I'm sure if you haven't heard of them before you'll have heard of some of their protests. Um, one of the Extinction Rebellion protests in August, no excuse me, April this year, shut down many areas of London causing huge public disruption, huge disruption to the economy um, in an effort to get out the message about climate change and to get the UK government to create, to declare rather a state of climate emergency and to um, encourage local councils to do the same. Um, they're an interesting organisation. One of their, they have kind of three key principles, one of which is they want local governments and media to tell the truth about the climate. So this is the climate science that we're talking about. They want to make sure that people have the information to know what situation it is we're in the middle of so that we can hold our governments accountable to reaching whatever targets we need to reach. And um, the other goal that they have is they want governments to push for a far more ambitious target than what any government is choosing to commit to. And that is net zero carbon emissions by 2025. To give you some perspective on that, uh, most governments are saying that they will get to something like 80%, as in the UK's case, uh, by 2050. That is 25 years too late. Um, their website is really good. If you head to there, now you might not quite be ready for what they're proposing you do but no harm in heading to their website and checking out the area where they actually lay down some of the facts about what's happening to our environment they have a lot of really good information up there that is simply it, it's hard to find it laid out all in one place but they do have a lot of it up there i want to read an extract from the uh this is not a drill this is the extinction rebellion handbook it's full of short essays by different um prominent thinkers and leaders on um, on kind of like climate discussions, climate science, that kind of thing. The first essay um, in that is called Die, Survive or Thrive by Farhana Yaman. So I just wanted to share with you some of the facts that she shares here. There's a particular section that I want to read from you to you from. She uses very strong vocabulary, ecological emergency, ecocide, things like that. Um, so there's some interesting figures here. The reality is that politicians and powerful elites who benefit from business as usual are not going to stop their destructive practices or loosen their grip on the financial and economic levers. They will keep asking for fossil fuel subsidies. The official estimates of financial report to fossil fuels are between US dollars, 370 billion and 620 billion over the period of 2010 to 2015. With the UK spending 10.5 billion a year, making the UK the biggest fossil fuel subsidizer in the EU. They demand we acknowledge their unfettered right to carry on financing new coal mines and fracking and opening up gas and oil reserves even in the last remaining pristine places on earth. We must insist that our rulers acknowledge that human rights and ecosystems are protected under law and must now be put at the centre of our legal, political and economic system. She continues on talking about how this business as usual model that a lot of people are trying to get us to move towards and trying to kind of like wave in our face to distract us is the best plan. We need to find ways to continue business as usual at all costs. And that's not necessarily what's going to serve any of us in the long term. Um, okay. Here's where we get to some science. Yay! At last, science. Okay. Before this, one of the things I want you to bear in mind is that um, one of the things that's at the heart of the Extinction Rebellion ethos and therefore at the heart of what people are writing in this particular um handbook or book is that uh, this should be a social revolution as much as an ecological one which means that people who are losing their jobs from the fossil fuel industry should be very much taken into account and put first as much as we can to make sure that we continue to make sure there's employment for them you know really make sure that they are put at the heart of these issues rather than swept under the rug if you get me um okay Climate change denialists cannot cover up the fact that the struggle for access to natural resources 
especially freshwater and arable land, is intensifying and that large parts of the planet are already becoming uninhabitable due to food and water scarcity. Humans have transformed 51% of Earth's land cover from forest and grassland to crops, cities and grazing lands but in ways that undermine agricultural productivity, destroy biodiversity and encroach on indigenous lands. Topsoil, um, I'll, I'll read this out first. Topsoil is now being lost 10 to 40 times faster than it can be replenished by nature. So topsoil, if you're not familiar with topsoil is, topsoil is the nutrients in our soil that make it possible for us to grow food, to grow crops, to grow anything. So let me read that again with that in mind. Topsoil is now being lost 10 to 40 times faster than it can be replaced by nature. And 30% of the world's arable land has become unproductive due to soil erosion since the mid 20th century. That's really quick. That's really quick. You know, this is this is only one lifetime. That's not even a lifetime. Um. So that's terrifying. The world's insect population has fallen by 60% since the 1970s. Large parts of Europe look green, but are biodiversity deserts. The birds and bees are dying. Current extinction rates are at least tens, possibly hundreds of times greater than background rates, destroying the entire ecosystems on both land and in the sea. Now, Bees are something that a lot of us can get behind. It seems to be a cause that people aren't afraid to kind of get behind it, sign petitions, support the bees. Um, but the rate at which we're losing other types of insects and other pollinators is frightening. 60% since the 1970s, folks. 60%. That's a lot of pollinators gone. That's a lot of food missing from the planet. It's scary. Next piece of science. Um, between 2006 and 2011, 60% of Syria suffered the worst long-term drought and crop failures in the country's history. Two to three million people became poor and many more, many more were internally displaced. The resulting social instability amplified the political factors that led to war in Syria, with now half its original population of 13 million having migrated or been internally displaced. Something similar is occurring in Yemen, where up to 10 million people face starvation. I can't even fathom that number. 10 million people face starvation, despite millions trying to move to safer, once fertile areas. So when we're talking about climate change, we're not just talking about something abstract that's happening somewhere else. We're talking about something that is happening to people across civilization. It's causing, it's making it their land unlivable, and that's amplifying political tensions, and it's allowing wars to be stoked, flames to be fanned. It's not just about abstract things like a trees that aren't that you might feel are outside, that are outside of us, that are not connected to us. This can happen anywhere. And it is happening. Um they received political wisdom that people in rich countries can sit tight and buy their way out of catastrophic environmental outcomes or know that the welfare state will save them, is looking more and more fanciful as we remain in the grip of austerity politics. Anyone with an understanding of how the global food system works, especially how much of the world's food supply passes through the lens, then it uh, passes through less than a dozen choke point ports, will know that our economies are deeply intertwined. Everyone will be affected, joining the millions who are already all over the world. Poor communities, especially people of colour, whether in the global north or the global south, who have always been on the front lines of environmental injustice, will also likely bear the brunt of new, new catastrophes. Um, that's just a, a smattering of some of the science for you. That doesn't even touch on what's happening with the acidification of our oceans. Oceans are getting warmer uh, globally. This means that the kind of composition of the oceans is changing and that means that life that used to be able to survive in the oceans can't anymore which is also affecting your food supply um uh, coral reefs are dying out the oceans are getting warmer um because we're losing a lot of ice 
uh, at a much, much faster rate than scientists about 10 years ago predicted. Way faster. It's way, way faster than what they'd initially predicted. Um, we're losing, I know this sounds like a bit simple, but you know the way heat take, uh, dark surfaces take in light and bright surfaces kind of uh, reflect it back. So when we're losing our ice caps, we're also losing something that is reflecting light back, harmful light, and like it's causing, um, so it's sort of sending, oh, excuse me, light and heat. It's sending it back in to um, the atmosphere rather than taking it in. So by losing all of our ice, we are also, the world is getting darker, which means the oceans are taking on more heat, which means that ocean temperatures are rising faster, which means that the ice melts faster, which means that, you know, what is it, something about 40% of the world's population lives in a, near coastal areas, near enough coastal areas, that they could lose their homes with the rising ocean levels. Um, while this seems like a distant future, um, one that we might not, you may think we might not live to see, we are seeing runaway effects of climate change much, much sooner than scientists originally predicted. Um, a lot of places that are very fragile, places like the Maldives that are only a fraction above sea level, um, they're losing their land. They are literally losing inches of places to live. And that is not something that will be isolated. That is something that is on its way and it is already happening. Um, it isn't a good picture when you look at the science and when you read what people who know the science have to say. Um, this book is not fun reading. It's not light reading, the one I've just read to you from. By the way, if you've just joined us, that was an extract from uh, the This Is Not A Drill, which was published by the Extinction Rebellion. It's a collection of essays. I was reading extract from uh, Farhane Yaman, um, sharing a bit of the science on climate change. Um, things are moving a lot faster than anyone had anticipated. It means that a lot of the global targets that have been set are no longer the games off for them. We need new targets and they need to be drastic. Um, there are some essays in that publication by people talking about preparing, preparing for the psychological, psychological impact of what's going to happen when, not if, when our current systems of governance and um, lifestyle ways of transporting eventually break down. I'm sorry to say that as I've becoming more I've been becoming more active in the last few weeks, um I am slowly coming to agree with that assessment. Climate change isn't something we can avert anymore. It's already here. It's already happening. We can't stop it from happening at this stage. It has gone too far. Um but we can stop it getting worse. And that's the best that we can do. Um, I don't know what's going to happen to our global food supply. I'm afraid to read more, to research more um, into what that will look like. But what I do know is that a lot of the ways of life that we are living now may not be around that much longer. Um, and I don't think that's because... I think it's because business as usual, the way that we are living is destructive. Even, and I'm sitting here, I'm going to call myself out, even sitting here late in the evening when the sun has gone down, expending power. A lot of you might hear that and think, oh, you're beating yourself up, you're being too hard on yourself. But guys, this is part of what's causing the problem is the energy consumption. So over the last two weeks, I've been looking at my habits and my lifestyle and going, this might not be viable that much longer. I want to start researching what I can do. Little things like, can I charge my phone on a solar, some sort of a solar panel thing? Can I do that with my Kindle? Um, what can I do to make sure that I'm not using up a huge amount of energy in the evenings? Can I get to bed at a better time in the evening um, to stop using so much energy? These are things that we're all going to have to face at some point. It looks like the way things are going. So I want to read to you a little bit now about a few things that I've just found in my research this evening about what different places have decided to do um, and whether that's enough. Hopefully this will prompt a conversation um, or give you some ideas for 
what you might chat to when you chat to people about this issue. So I think we're doing each other a massive favour when we talk about this frankly. We need to be talking about this frankly. There's no point. We've seen the governments aren't interested in doing it for us. I mean, the jury's out on how you want to go about making them do that. But um, I think that it's looking more and more like direct action and civil disobedience may be the only way to go. Peaceful. Peaceful, always peaceful. Um, but that might be just how it is. We'll see, I guess. Um, I did a little bit of reading into what Ireland is planning to do because obviously that's my home country. That's where I'm going to be living um, someday, not again, someday not too far from now. So today is a very significant day, as you know, the UN Global Summit um, on the Climate Crisis. Um, the annual summit has started up again in New York. Greta Thunberg delivered a very emotional um, powerful speech, as is her absolute thing um, today. She's right. Not enough of us are taking responsibility or taking action. I count myself in there. I've been cowardly. You know, we're we're staying indoors and doing our jobs and doing business as usual when really we should be out there and I'm hoping I can get up the courage soon sooner rather than later to join in with that a bit more actively but I'd like to just look at what Ireland has said it's going to do now Ireland has um a climate advisory council and they set up an annual review uh, they published an annual review rather in July chaired by a gentleman called Professor John Fitzgerald so Excuse me, I just found that news report that e this evening, it's, uh, sorry, the annual review this evening. It is 183 pages long. So I have not had the chance to read the whole thing. One of the main reasons I wanted to look at, and I will be reading it myself, is that I want to find out what was what the Irish government were advised um, by this advisory council. I want to see where they were drawing their information from. I want to see if it's up to the latest. And I want to email... Um, uh, people in power and support some of the things that I think they're doing that are really good and really on target and voice my support for further action. So Varadkar is over at this, uh, he's, he's the Irish Taoiseach or the Irish Prime Minister and um, he's over there now, he's going to be talking with other nations about this and Ireland has a set a certain number of targets and things it's going to do. Some of the ones that have gotten the biggest press are um this announcement that Ireland are going to plant 44 million trees by 2040 um, as trees are largely being heralded as one of the best ways that we can capture carbon in the atmosphere. Now, I love trees. I am big on planting trees. I always want to be sceptical. Um, I think governments are slow moving. Um, I don't know if they have to be, but they certainly are. That's the way things are. So when we think about this 44 million trees target, excuse me, oh, long day. Um, we have to ask ourselves, what kind of trees are they going to plant? Are they going to plant native trees? I know there's a big concern about that because a part of encouraging natural biodiversity is that you plant what would actually grow there naturally. Um, I found uh, an article on a website called ecowatch.com and it had a comment included on it by a man called Porrick Fogarty who is in the Irish Wildlife Trust who said, you know, something similar, all for planting trees and everything, but that trees tend to not want to be planted. They tend to want to plant themselves. So what we need to do are create natural environments where trees can grow. So his advice or his comment on it was that he felt that the Irish government should give, instead of money for planting trees, they should offer money to people working in agriculture to let land just become uh what's the wording on it just a place where things can grow naturally like a, res a reserve um rewilding i think was the phrase he used yeah that um putting money into rewilding would do the same thing but maybe in a more healthy way and i agree with that because after all human interference has caused this problem um why not let nature take the reins Nature knows what it's doing. Our interference has been the problem historically. So I don't think that's a bad plan. I would be very pro seeing some rewilding happening. Um, there was some really interesting facts that came out of um, Jordan's cereal company. So they're based in the UK. 
Um, any farmers who provide to Jordans have to set aside a certain amount of their land as a nature reserve. And that has done huge things for pollinators and for wildlife in their areas because suddenly they have a place to live. So if we look at rewilding, um, we're potentially encouraging the growth of a lot of other things that our environment is sorely missing. More pollinators, more place for wildlife to live, um, all those kinds of things. So that's Ireland's commitment on trees. Um, Ireland has... It's kind of strange almost. But Ireland has committed to stopping uh to oh, how do I phrase this phrase this Ugh. to cease issuing permits for oil drilling which is really cool although I think a few weeks back they issued another one for some strange reason after coming out with that and everyone's like hang on a second folks that's really dumb um but anyway this seems to be part of what the Irish government says it's going to do to tackle climate change that's very ambitious that's very landmark I 100% promote that. I think it's a brave thing to do. Um, however, they have also said that they will still be issuing permits for research into natural gas. Um, Ireland has many places offshore that are very rich in natural gas. And they have stated that they want to use that as a sort of a gateway into a zero carbon economy. I mean, in terms of a slow moving system... That is really um, almost married to carbon methods. I see that I see the areas in which that's brave, but in terms of what science is saying and what's actually happening in our environment, it's not really enough, in my opinion. And I think they need to be called out on that. So if you're Irish, um, maybe look this up for yourself. Uh, what Ireland is doing to commit to the to uh, you know, preventing more damage in our climate. I think it just needs to stop. I mean, based on what the science is saying, based on what's actually happening. Why not follow up one ambitious target with another? I know it's going to be difficult, but it's going to be difficult for us all anyway. Um, One of the other problems with what Ireland is doing to combat the climate crisis is that we are setting 2050 as our target. Like other developed nations, we are setting 2050 as our target Um, for when we will reach these agreements, when we will reach these magical figures where we are no longer um, contributing to the problem with um, the same absolute abandon that we're doing right now. 2050 is not soon enough. It's not soon enough. Scientists are already coming out and saying, whoa, guys, this is happening faster than we imagined. So 2050 is a target that comes from an earlier time. I'm sorry, but it does. We, I think that Extinction Rebellion are right. I think that 2025 is a ridiculously ambitious target. But if we don't hit for that, we have to hit for that. We have to try and move for that. Um, and we have to put pressure on governments to doing that. So that's really, really crucial. If you're in Ireland, um, I think it's a good idea to get in touch with your TD and let them know. I'm so in support of not issuing any of these permits anymore I so support the efforts to plant the trees although I do agree with rewilding that is if you actually agree with me um, uh, and um, Park Fogarty of the Irish Wildlife Trust that rewilding would be a really great way to do that um, and you could say I appreciate that we're setting a target and we're making bold moves that other governments aren't making but that's not enough it's not enough according to what the climate needs and the climate isn't a politician it just is what it is it's a complex fragile ecosystem it doesn't speak English and it's not going to work to your deadline it's not going to work to my deadline it's not going to work to anyone's deadline we have to work with it for once so um I would really strongly encourage you to do that and then to follow up with whatever level of action you are capable of doing um another thing about what's happening in Ireland from what I've said um from a few comments Radker made today um which was interesting, was um, there was this talk of a carbon tax and where the revenue from the carbon tax was going to go. Um, there was some talk, I seem to have missed this, but there was some talk about sending checks back to every house in Ireland or something like that, um, which has since been revised. And what he's saying now is that the money from those taxes will go back into green initiatives in communities and will go back into things like 
making sure there are jobs out there for people who are losing their jobs because of the switch from carbon economy to a zero carbon economy. Um, that is good in theory. In theory, that is very good. Um, in theory, a lot of what we should be fighting for as we fight for climate justice is, well, justice. That people who are going to lose jobs because they used to work on an oil rig or because they worked in a gas company fitting boilers. You know, th these people can't be left out in the cold in this new economy and in this new version of the way things are going to go. We have to march for them as much as we are marching for the loss of our climate. And we have to be straight about what we want. We want these people included in the future. We want to make sure that they have something to move to. Um, and I like the idea of what Varadkar is saying, that that money will be put into initiatives or even into going directly into renewable energy and making sure that the people who have had to leave carbon, kind of like oil drilling, um, natural gas exploration, people who are in that sector, get these jobs in the new sector. It seems to me to be only fair. Um, now, what a politician says and what a politician can actually deliver are two different things. Um, and I hope that this isn't just talk. I'll be monitoring it. I think we should all be monitoring it. But we would already hope that the Irish government are committed to really, really delivering on that. Um, in the same way as in recent times, you know, the Irish people and the Irish government, even though, I, you know, I'm... I'm suspicious of any government. You put a load of rich people in charge, they're going to need to be reminded who they work for and they're going to meet, need to be reminded re regularly that it's us they need to listen to. Um, if they can deliver on this, they will be... I mean, history is going to look kindly on them. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the Climate Advisories Council annual review. I mean, by looking forward to, I mean, I'm frightened to read it. Um, but in what Faradkar is saying about the natural gas and about the 2050 target, um, they're talking about taking their cue from this report from the Climate Advisory Council. So I'm curious to see where their figures come from and where their numbers come from, because I wonder if they are up to speed on what's been happening lately. I wonder... Was the review kind of finished early last year and only went to press now? Do you know that kind of thing? So it's something I want to look at and analyse a bit more. So in that sense, I'm looking forward to reading it. There was another interesting little article that I came across that was published in April, um, or report, reporting findings of a survey that was carried out in April, that highlighted some sort of strange uh, cognitive dissonances in people. So... There was a survey carried out, an online survey in April. I didn't check who funded that survey, which is a pretty important question to ask, but the survey was carried out. It was reported in The Independent in April and it talked about um, how 90, excuse me, ooh, if only it was 90, 9% of us, so this is in Ireland, think about our carbon footprint when food shopping. This is weird because in that same article, it says something along the lines of, let me pull it up, 82% of people think that shopping should be a more environmentally friendly process. So let me just see if I can find that exact one. Yeah, here we go. So this is Alison Bray uh, writing for The Independent in Ireland. So actually this is published in July, excuse me. She's publishing on a survey that was carried. She's speaking about a survey that was carried out in April, rather. Okay, so... um. An online survey of 2,000 Irish adults between the ages of 18 and 65 conducted in April found that just 9% of Irish consumers consider the effect of their food purchases on carbon emissions. Yet, 82% of respondents said consumers needed to change how food was produced and consumed in order to minimise climate change. So we know that climate change is a thing now. We're just not really sure how we fit in. And this is why organisations like Extinction Rebellion are calling on governments and media to report the science, to report what's actually going on. Because unless we know how bad it's getting out there, we have figures like this. We have figures like 9% of us don't think about, you know, the impact of carbon emissions in our food shop. 
But 82% of us think that it should be something that, that we think the climate change should be minimised. It's, it's a bit, it's a bit odd. Um, actually, this, this survey was, was carried out, where is it? I saw it now that I remember it. I think it was the National Dairy Council or something. So, um, this is actually just a really interesting little article. I'm going to post links to everything I've mentioned in the description of this, by the way, so that you can check in on what I've been looking at today yourselves. Again, I would highly recommend that Extinction Rebellion link because it's just got a lot of the facts in one place. It's going to be harder to find it separately. Um, so if you want to get started, that's a good place to get started. 92% um, of consumers believe Ireland is worthy of its world-renowned reputation for producing high-quality dairy products. But almost 42% uh, said that they believe the dairy sector has a negative effect on climate change. And they are right. I was browsing on another website this evening. I think it was uh, scientistwarning.com. Scientistwarning.org. And on their homepage, one of the key things they say is consume less. Um, I think it's less dairy. Definitely they say less meat. 100% they're saying consume less meat. Let me just navigate to that front page so that I can tell you exactly what it says. Um, so we believe that Irish dairy is good, but we don't necessarily know if it's good for the climate. So that is a bit of a weird one. That is something that we're going to have to address at some point on a on a more mass level than we currently are. Um, I know a lot of people get very hung up on their love of meat. Uh, they will say things like, but bacon at you. And I don't know, I don't think if you if you live in a world that doesn't have a food supply anymore, it's going to be difficult to enjoy anything. That would be kind of my take on it. I say that as someone who still eats meat, although I've cut down my consumption of it hugely. Um, what does it say about Yes, so... Uh, interventions, there are too many possible interventions to name, but just a few are listed below. So the second point they have here, the first point they have is join in with organised groups. Get mass movements going. The second is eat lower on the food chain, eat less fish, less fowl and animal products less often, moving towards vegetarian and vegan options more often. So if you're out and you see a vegan option that looks good, take it. Um, a lot of people are doing things now like going vegan for breakfast and for lunch or they'll be weekday vegetarians or weekday vegans or something like that. I mean, I think we should all try for that. It's what the scientists are saying, so I don't see why not to give it a go. Um, so, yeah, so there's some weird, I, and I wonder if it's similar in the UK, although I haven't seen a similar article. We're all kind of looking for answers external to ourselves. We're looking for external people to blame or external people who should be taking action and the truth is everyone has to take action so we have to look at what we can do on an individual level that is much more proactive than what we're already doing so I've been going I've been ramping up my own efforts to engage in zero waste practices lately and um, start to look for things like I'm not going to you know trying to look at not buying chocolate bars anymore and seeing what the zero waste shops have in terms of confectionery and getting them in jars and so far that has been very aesthetically pleasing just gonna say it's nothing nicer than a giant jar full of chocolate buttons it's just a very satisfying thing to hold um i'm trying to ramp up my own personal efforts but i'm also trying to see what organizations in my community are doing and i'm posting about it on my instagram and sharing it hopefully to encourage other people to join in and be active in this area um, all of us need to do that. We all need to do it. We share the planet. We need to do it together. Um, so Extinction Rebellion have a lot of good resources up there. I think you should check them out. And they have a lot of different organisations if you're looking for a local one to join. There's so many in Ireland. Stop Climate Chaos, uh, Friends of the Earth. Both organisations criticised the decision to... Um, stick with natural gas when we're going to be trying to kick oil in Ireland so those could be good places to start um in terms of what's happening in the UK I don't know as much about the UK is very sidetracked by Brexit although it did declare a national emergency 
Um, it has not acted like there is a national emergency. In fact, it has continued to tell lies and half-truths about the state of the UK's emissions. So Greta Thunberg, as usual, comes to the bloody rescue um, in a speech that she delivered back in April, which I found a transcript of. So I want to read a little bit of that for you as well. So I'm going to include a link to the full speech in the description when we're done. Um, she talks about how governments all over the world are falling short in the speech and she kind of lists some of the ways that that's happening. She lists the impacts that it has on her. She talks um, in a way that's quite emotive about her future, where she would like to be in 2030 um, by the time we will reach a point of absolutely no return um, where her younger sister will be by the time her younger sister is 23. Um, and she kind of talks about the future that she's hoping to have, that she she knows she is being robbed of by, you know, collective inaction. Um, and she continues. So she says, the UK, however, after mentioning the US, or I think also Europe as well, the UK is, however, very special. Not only for its mind-blowing historical carbon debt, but also for its current very creative carbon accounting. I love this girl. Since 1990, the UK has achieved a 37% reduction of its territorial CO2 emissions, according to the Global Carbon Project. And that does sound very impressive. But these numbers do not include emissions from aviation, shipping, and those associated with imports and exports. If these numbers are included, the reduction is around 10% since 1990, or an average of 0.4% a year, according to Tyndall Manchester. And the main reason for this reduction is not a consequence of climate policies, but rather a 2001 EU directive on air quality that essentially forced the UK to close down its very old and extremely dirty coal power plants and replace them with less dirty gas power stations. And switching from one disastrous energy, energy source to a slightly less disastrous one will of course result in a lowering of emissions. But perhaps the most dangerous misconception about the climate crisis is that we have to lower our emissions because that is far from enough. Our emissions have to stop if we are to stay below 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade of warming. The lowering of emissions is of course necessary but it is only the beginning of a fast process that must lead to a stop within a couple of decades or less. And by stop, I mean net zero and then quickly on to negative figures. That rules out most of today's politics. The fact that we are speaking of lowering instead of stopping emissions is perhaps the greatest force behind the continued business as usual. The UK's active current support of new explo exploitation of fossil fuels, for example, the UK shale gas fracking industry, the expansion of its North Sea oil and gas fields, the expansion of airports, as well as the planning permission for a brand new coal mine, is beyond absurd. This ongoing irresponsible behaviour will no doubt be remembered in history as one of the greatest failures of humankind. Greta Thunberg, ladies and gentlemen, speaking to the UK government in April of this year, earlier, um, a real advocate of the science. She's she's really amazing. Um, so if you just joined now, or if you're kind of joining a little later in the video today, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the science behind climate change and give some examples of things the governments are saying that we should challenge, um, things that we should praise them for if we feel like they're being bold and taking a bold action. That that actually is appropriate to what the science is telling us and is appropriate to what we're seeing around us in terms of people being displaced, in terms of crop failures around the world, famines, um, then we should be applauding that. But we should also be keen to hold them accountable for the areas where they are not moving fast enough. And that is a rallying cry that we all need to become part of as much as we can. We are in a capitalist world. I think it's silly not to to pretend that where we spend our money doesn't make a difference, it does. We have the power to dictate consumer trends, but we need to move the needle a hell of a lot faster than the corporations are going to move if they have their way. So 
I've been talking about some of the science and what I have been saying is that the science can be tricky to find. Most news articles you'll see about it will talk about speeches, will talk about uh, symbolic actions. They'll even, you know, have videos of Greta Thunberg speaking, but they won't report the science. They'll report the 1.5 degree figure or the 2 degree figure. They may report um, the 2050 targets. They may report that um, organisations... Um, environmental organisations are pushing for a 2025 target, but they won't tell you the figures. They don't seem to be keen on reporting those. Um, and while I, you know, I don't want there to be a state of mass hysteria or for people to be frightened necessarily, um, the science says that we should be frightened and we should be quite worried. So we kind of should be following the science. The science says, and the research around what causes change says that we all need to get our feet onto the streets. And we need to do things that are um, impossible to ignore. So I'm going to, when I sign off this video, I'm going to post all the links for the articles I was mentioning into um, the description so that you can check them out and have a read for yourself. Um, I hope that this discussion today has prompted some questions in you, some ways of looking at things. Um, I hope it's filled you with a I don't mean to be negative but with a healthy amount of scepticism for what the news is reporting and for what governments are saying politicians will politish folks they're going to want to make themselves look as good as possible at all times so they're going to make it look like if they're delivering you a shit sandwich they're going to tell you it's a gourmet roast dinner um you don't have to swallow the shit sandwich nor should you um and I hope that this discussion has maybe helped if you weren't sure what type, kind of questions you needed to ask, if you weren't sure where to go, if you weren't sure what the science was, because people are saying, the science, the science, but we're not actually talking about the figures that are the science. Um, things like topsoil, things like uh, mass extinction, uh, things like uh, political unrest in countries where there's famines, these kinds of things, these are the, the costs that we are already paying. Um, there's so many more than what I read out this evening, but... Um, it's it's a very complex problem so there's a lot to read about unfortunately um, I hope that some of the links I post will be a good start for you please share them share your thoughts on them with people post them on your Facebook you know if we have to go kind of like a bit of a popular route that it's the cool thing to do to get out there and protest I mean there's so much worse things that could be popular do you know what I'm saying so you know be a trendsetter and talk about this more if you're not already talking about it lots um so as always i've got um some great support from my patrons over on patreon i always want to acknowledge um a few people who help me make videos sometimes i forget to when i'm doing a live video but i put them in the description at the end so big thank you to paul taylor big thank you to simon wilkie um if any of you want to join me over there for music you're more than welcome to this video is mostly about um, environments if that's what you've tuned in for I'm just going to talk a little bit about music now while any of you have any questions um, if you want to ask those I mean I'm not a climate scientist myself I just know the things that I know from my own research um, uh, from what I've seen it's a bit scary out there um, and I'm certainly moving towards taking more action than I have before um, so I'm going to talk really quickly a little bit about what I have coming up musically. I'm going to keep an eye on my comments here. So if you have questions, thoughts, anything you want to share, um, just pop them up here and I'll be able to see them in the feed. So um, looking at you guys over here now, if you want to contribute anything or ask anything. Um, so for me, music-wise, what's coming up, I've quite a busy week this week. Um, on top of teaching and rehearsals for other things, I have got a Deepdale Music Festival on Friday. And then on Saturday, I am in the Warwick Street Social um, and that's going to be really, really good fun. So if you want to head to my website, Asher, I'll throw a link into that as well. If you want to head to my website, emmaoreilly.ie forward slash tour, you can check out what upcoming dates I have. I've posted a bunch of them over the last week. That includes dates in London. Yay! Yay, London! Um, a couple more around Norwich, um, including a panel that I'm going to be doing at the Wild Paths Festival in Norwich. 
and a date in my hometown in Ballinasloe in Galway coming up in December. There will be more dates coming up there soon, so um, feel free to return to that site as soon as you want. Also, I tend to post about them on my Instagram if you want to follow me there and here on Facebook um, if you are not already following me. So feel free to do those things. There's always the mailing list, of course, as well. Um, I'll post a link to that too. So I've got a busy week of gigging coming up, which is good. Um, for now, I want to say thank you so much to anyone who's watched even a little bit of this video. Um, we can only tackle what we can of this problem when we do it together and when we talk about it and when we make it the done thing when we decide look this is on the agenda this is just how I'm doing things no I'm not going to fly there no I'm not going to get the thing in plastic I'll just be better organized and I'll get it from somewhere when I bring in my jar tomorrow and I can get it refilled um we can't expect other people to do it for us not all of us are going to have the budget to move to bulk methods of shopping and that kind of thing so if you're someone who has that extra wiggle room and you're really honest with yourself, please use it. That is part of your political power. Um, and it's part of what you can do to make those kind of options more accessible for people on all budgets is if they become the done thing. Um, so I hope that this has inspired you. I hope it's made you feel part of something a bit more. I hope if you were feeling intimidated before that you feel a little less intimidated now, baby, because you're not on your own and there's lots of people around the world who are trying to fight this with you. Um, it's worth bearing in mind just as a final comment that um, there's been a lot of research done and quoted by Extinction Rebellion on social movements and which ones have affected change and how have they actually rapidly affected change one of the findings from some of that research is that for there to be quick and effective social change there needs to be between 3 and 5% of the population um carrying out actions, uh, direct actions. So the more of us join, the closer we get to those kind of percentages. And we can do that peacefully. It's possible. It is something we are capable of. Maybe it's not something we've had to be capable of um, from where we've come from, but we can do amazing things. We can affect amazing change when we just decide that's it, this needs to change. So keep that figure in mind. And, you know, do what you can. Do a little more research. Change one thing when you're used to that change another thing. And um, bring one person to a demonstration. Ask that person if there's another person they can bring. Um, those actions are so powerful. And no one can make you do those things, but you can choose to do them. And it would just be so, so impactful. So... I'm going to be, I might not do another video like this again for a little while. I feel I have so much more to learn about what's going on um, with the science, with the local movements. But I will be posting stories about it on here on Facebook. I will be posting stories about it on Instagram. And I have a little story section on my Instagram for Climate SOS. Um, if you're looking for ideas, tips, things that you can do, ways that other people are doing it, I'm going to be sharing my story from there. And occasionally in a few Instagram posts there and some Facebook posts here. So thank you so much for joining me today. It's a really serious topic. I know it's not the lightest thing for a Monday evening, but it is important because it affects all of us. So with that, I'm going to close this video. It's so brilliant to see people sticking around to listen to this because this is really important stuff. I'm going to say namaste. There's a light in every one of us that we have this knowledge. We know what it is we need to do. And other people out there also know what it is we need to do. So we can see light in other people. Even if their habits are bad now, even if they're working for industries that aren't doing their bit, we can see the light in them and we can include them and inspire them to come forward and um, fight with them side by side. So namaste. I see the light in you. I hope you guys see light in me and um, recognize the light in yourself and recognize the power that you have where this comes from. Um, this is serious, but when large numbers of people get serious about something together, 
we can do really powerful stuff. So here is to um, celebrating science, um, not ignoring the science and experiencing the absolute amazing thing that is our personal power and our collective power. So I'll be back again with Let There Be Music. If you have a topic you'd like to hear me talk about that is music specific, that's what generally what I actually get into when I'm not talking about the climate. Um, feel free to leave a comment. Feel free to let me know what you'd like to hear me talk about. And I'll be back again next week. Until then, namaste everybody. Have a really lovely rest of your evening. Get to bed at a reasonable hour. I know I'm going to try to. And have a great week. And I'll see you again either at the festival on Friday, at the gig on Saturday, possibly on Patreon if you want to hear some new music. And um, if not, on Monday on another live video next week. Okay, good night.